All right, g'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for uh, another rendition of uh, the things I learned or my thoughts generally on the latest AFL round. So if you didn't catch it last week, this is gonna be a regular segment I'll be doing on the channel where I sort of discuss all the things that I thought about the, the round. It's gonna be fairly unprepared, just talking it off the noggin from start to finish what I made of the round that was. I will still be doing just the tips every week, uh, but that's likely to be a regular Wednesday thing uh, in case you've missed that. There's another pretty good round of footy. Uh, I commented that the round one set of fixtures was uh, genuinely enjoyable, and it was, and maybe the round two standard wasn't quite as high. I think the top stories and, and the exciting stuff was really good. The best games were really good, but I think we saw a new low in terms of how bad some teams either are or potentially just look at the moment. Some of the bottom tier stuff this round uh, was quite shocking, but we're going to get into all of that. As always, guys, if you're enjoying the content that I put out, uh, please consider subscribing to the channel. Still about 40% of you who watch my videos are, are still unsubscribed to the channel. So if, uh, if you're liking what I'm putting out, it would mean a lot to me. But without further ado, let's get straight into round two. So the round kicked off uh, with what I would have considered a bit of an upset, Carlton undoing the Western Bulldogs on Thursday night from memory. I think it's fair to say it was an upset. You know, Carlton missed the finals last year and beat Richmond in round one, but the Bulldogs obviously having played in the grand final and only having lost to Melbourne the week before, I think it was fair to suggest that they were comfortable favourites, although there were some murmurs they thought an upset was brewing and Carlton do have a good history against the Dogs and they played really, really well. They got out to a very big lead. The Dogs nearly pegged it back, but ultimately Carlton were too good by 12 points. And I think the major telling difference was probably Carlton's talls. It's nice to have two of them in the same forward line for once, at least from their perspective. Kerno kick five. Mackay kick four, so nine goals between the two, and uh, I think we can all sort of agree that the Bulldogs' tall defenders is probably an area of their list that uh, isn't a strong suit. So the tall timber getting on the end of a few was huge for the Blues, but also let's not discount the midfield. Uh, guys like Cripps in particular and Sam Walsh had an amazing return to form with Chera out. These guys stood up, and yeah, suddenly Carlton 2-0 are playing some of the best football across the league, and like I said, the gap between the best teams and the worst teams seems to be quite high right now. Where does this leave the Bulldogs? To be honest, I, uh, I think they can chalk this up as a bit of bad luck, but obviously when you want to go for top four, uh, you could probably only lose about six games in a season. So to go 0-2 is not ideal, but I would argue they've had some pretty tough opposition so far. On Friday night, we had uh, probably the most talked about game of the round, Sydney beating Geelong by five goals at the SCG. And obviously we all know what happened with Buddy Franklin kicking his 1,000 goals. If you want to see my thoughts on Buddy Franklin as a player, I did release a video last week, so you can go check out that. It was an amazing achievement, but it almost overshadowed the fact that Sydney had a very, very big win in the context of the season to notch four points over Geelong, who I still think will be around the mark this year. It's a big win, and it's not really getting talked about for what it was. And Buddy kicked four, which is a great effort considering he would have been manhandled all night for the second week in a row. Isaac Heaney bobbed up and kicked five goals again. Not really a talking point because Buddy Franklin was the man of the hour and rightfully so. For Geelong it's a tough away loss at the SCG. I wouldn't read too much into it. Brad Close played probably his best game of his career I'd imagine with four goals but ultimately just got beaten by a good side at their home deck so fair play. Then early on Saturday morning Butcher and I live streamed Collingwood versus Adelaide and this game more or less went the way I expected it to. Collingwood continuing their form of the young guys bobbing up and playing really really well to support what I would consider a very very strong best six to eight players. The fact that they've backed it up again is impressive albeit it was Adelaide and I think Adelaide are certainly in the middle of a rebuild at the moment. Collingwood have definitely surprised me with how quickly they've sort of transitioned into being a good competitive team. So it's too early to make big calls on, you know, how far Collingwood could go. But like I said, they're looking better than a good handful of teams in the comp right now. So they're certainly one to watch. It will be interesting if we have a season now where Carlton, Collingwood and Hawthorne are all good again. It takes me back to 10 years ago when the Eagles were terrible and those were some of the bigger teams. So hopefully we're not at that point yet. Later that day, Essendon took on the Brisbane Lions and uh, they got out to a massive lead and it seemed at one point like they were going to run away with it, but Brisbane clawed them back and it was frustrating to be honest watching Essendon. I feel like, uh, well, I'm going to say this about another team later in this video as well, but I feel like they were a bit of an almost team. It felt like they looked damaging at times, looked like they were really going to burn Brisbane and ultimately would just cough up a, a stupid you know, skill error and turn the ball over. But Brisbane are good. You know, they, they've played two rounds now where maybe they haven't reached their, you know, their top flight and who cares if they have because it's only round two, but they've responded whenever they've been challenged so far and admittedly they've beaten the two bottom teams on the ladder, I think, Essendon and Port, but still a good away win for them and gee, Lockie Neal loves playing the Bombers, another 39, 40 touches for him, couple of goals, one disallowed right at the end outstanding performance. Now, there were a few surprising results this weekend, uh, as you could probably tell from my footy tipping score, which was uh, pretty putrid. I'm not sure what I got in the end, but I certainly didn't see this performance coming when Hawthorne annihilated Port Adelaide at Adelaide Oval. 
Now, again, I, I feel like out there in the AFL community, there was a bit of a buzz around how Hawthorne could pull off an upset. And to be honest, I was skeptical. Port Adelaide don't really drop too many games against teams they're expected to beat at home. It's kind of a fortress for them there, unless you're one of the top teams. I certainly didn't see Hawthorne's you know, clinical performance coming there. They were good in defense. Their pressure was good all night. And their ball use going forward was outstanding. It made it easy for guys like Mitch Lewis, uh, who kicked five goals. Great performance from him, not taking anything away from him. But it's one of those nights, I feel like with Hawthorne, everything just clicked. The bizarre thing is I don't even think Port Adelaide played horridly. Like, sure, certainly wasn't their best performance, but I didn't feel like they were truly down. I just think, you know, Hawthorne managed them well. They defended really well, cut off their entries, rebounded well as we knew they had the potential to do, and then moved the ball in a way that was very, very hard to defend. So I remember hearing on the radio, Sam Mitchell had apparently said, you know, Hawthorne want to try and score 120 points a game. So they're obviously playing an attacking game style this year. And it was funny to hear that right before Hawthorne go out and score 120 points at Adelaide Oval. So again, I don't know if you can put a big cap on, on where Hawthorne could finish this year. That was a performance of a top four team but is their depth going to be stretched this year? You know, in the COVID year, that's, there's that potential. It did feel like it was a night where everything simply clicked for them and they played their brand really, really well. So, you know, it remains to be seen where they can maintain that. But gee, they look, you know, it was possibly the best performance of any team this round. Gold Coast played Melbourne uh, pretty much at the same time. It was slightly staggered. Uh, they played Melbourne at the Metricon Stadium, which I, you know, made a blue last week. I forgot that Carrara was Metricon, but anyway. And, you know, they did pretty well. They got within 13 points, and uh, that wasn't a massive surprise to me. I do feel like Gold Coast are dangerous at the start of the year. I've been saying this for a while. You must be sick of me saying it. So the fact that they came out and challenged a very good team like Melbourne uh, didn't surprise me. For Melbourne, it was just about acquiring the four points, and that's exactly what they did. Again, didn't watch this game too closely, so I can't give you too much analysis. It looks like Tuk Miller went nuts again with 38 possessions, as he so typically does, and perhaps Petra notched himself six Brownlow votes in the opening two rounds. So you think between him and Cripps, they've both had an amazing start to the year. Petrarca had 40 in the end, so that's 79 in two games. Outstanding. Then the Sunday games kicked off with North Melbourne versus West Coast, a potential grand final preview, I think. Now, if you tuned into the live stream, you'll, you'll probably have a good feel of, uh, of my thoughts on the game. Uh, obviously, the context of it was for the second round in a row, West Coast had absolutely decimated by unavailability, had five, six top-ups, and that was exacerbated by Nelson getting injured in the warm-up and then, you know, another one coming in. Honestly, from a West Coast perspective, fairly happy with the effort. Um, you know, to get within 15 points with such an underdone and, you know, undermanned team, uh, it, it's ridiculous, to be honest. I, I thought we would lose by 10 goals. North had a bit of their own adversity. You know, I felt like a lot of their players were getting hit and injured. So thankfully it wasn't us for once. Taron Thomas, LDU, these guys left the game early and uh, perhaps that could have impacted the eventual margin. But to be honest, it was a pretty putrid performance for North Melbourne. They're not going to like me saying that, but I, I think that is the consensus among their fans as well. You know, while the Eagles played with good spirit and, you know, you've got to weight that into the equation as well. Some of the basic skill errors from North, uh, it, it was a rare opportunity for them to really get a hold of a team and I feel like they could have annihilated the Eagles had they uh, been a bit more switched on. But it's a long season. They're a rebuilding team and, you know, they're going to improve over the course of the year. But gee, it was it was a bit of a hollow victory, I think. The middle Sunday game was Richmond versus GWS. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't catch this because I had errands to run. But uh, Richmond responded well after a, uh, a loss to Carlton last week, which in context doesn't look so bad anymore with Carlton knocking off the Western Bulldogs. So for Richmond to do it with the injuries they have, and I'd been questioning their depth lately, Prestia was out. Dusty obviously missed the game as well. They looked in control and you know they're a good system team and they managed to play that way as well from a Giants perspective I think it's a disappointing result I think this was a winnable game for them on paper that being said when you go to the MCG and you're coming up against Richmond who I know they missed the finals last year but when they actually employ their style and they're playing their way it's very very hard to break them down and ultimately Richmond were just far too good so the Giants go 0-2 and, and it's going to be a competitive year again for the top eight so uh, that's a blow but I think it's one they can probably shake off and finally saving the best for last Fremantle versus St Kilda at Optus Stadium I got this tip wrong I thought Fremantle were going to be, you know, comfortably too good at home for St. Kilda. But gee whiz, not a really good game. A really, really poor spectacle, to be honest. Sometime during the second quarter, I made the comment to some mates in the group chat. I was like, geez, St. Kilda are terrible. They are really, really bad. At this point, Fremantle were a few goals in front. And uh, I didn't actually realize that St. Kilda were actually sort of dominating a lot of the stats. Because of their poor skill execution, their fumbles, their drop marks, it, it was a game like that all day. It was hard to notice that they were actually outplaying Fremantle. And I'm sorry to be negative, on, you know, on a win. I just thought, you know, that it didn't look like two teams that were better than the bottom four. Does that make sense? I would like to think St. Kilda have a bit more to give than the performance they showed. Although ultimately, you know, you have to give them credit. Higgins in particular and Max King really took their opportunities. And that was the difference between the two teams. They, they did generate enough opportunities. And eventually when they started getting a hold of some of them, they were too good. For Fremantle, this is a bad loss, to be honest. 
for them, particularly in that third quarter, but throughout a lot of the game, to be honest, they just weren't generating the opportunities. I know they're a little bit undermanned in the midfield with Fife and Mundy out, and Sean Darcy unfortunately rolled his ankle and didn't play too much in the second half. Regardless of that, it was uh, it was a poor showing for a side that should be aspiring to you know improve and, and play finals, but. That performance would have been a bad performance factored against last year's team as well. In other words, so far, I don't know if they've actually improved this year. They've gone backwards. Having said that, they're a young team. It's a long season. And uh, who knows, like North Melbourne, like I said about them, they may improve over the course of the year. And I probably expect them to. They were a little bit lucky that St Kilda, like I alluded to with Essendon, they're, they're an almost team. It felt like, you know, they had a chance to burn the opposition so many times, but there'd be a skill error coming out of the back half and then Fremantle would grub the ball inside 50 and then there'd be three Saints fumbles, a free kick given away against, kicked out of bounds on the full. It, it was one of those games. And to be honest, both of those sides will want to improve greatly for next week. Anyways, guys, that is my general thoughts on round two. So some very good performances in that round, some outstanding performances, in fact. Uh, and, you know, I was pretty scathing on the teams that didn't play well because uh, the, the gap between the top and the bottom this round was stark. But as always, I welcome you to let me know in the comments what you think. Some of you may feel I went a little bit too harshly on your team, but I'm just trying to offer a neutral opinion. And that is my honest opinion. Some of the football was terrible. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you're interested in my tips, they will come out later this week as well. And I will be on the Drew Footy Show uh, sometime early this week as well. So keep an eye out for that on Drewzy's channel. As always, guys, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.